Hi everyone, Kevin and at Eagle Strong Voice again. It's August 25th. Well, don't you love the way that mass murderers continually need to pretend their crime never happened and deny that their evidence is nowhere in sight? Of course, that charade is playing itself out again in Canada, where the mass murderers of Indian residential school children pretending now that the graves of their victims don't exist. So the question, of course, is where do the little bodies go? That's why I wrote this piece, Bodies, Bodies, Who's Got the Bodies? Once more down Canada's memory hole. Starting with some telling quotes from John Zimmerman, the principal of the Anglican Mohawk Indian School in May 1948 in Brantford, Ontario, when he said to the government, we've been forced to bury the children two and three to a grave. There are so many of them. And the researcher for the Anglican church that ran that death camp, Leona Moses, said to me in January 2012, Archbishop Fred Hills told all of us back in the spring of 2010 that any evidence of the Mohawk school death records and the kids' graves had to be destroyed immediately. And of course that infamous spook, the RCMP inspector Peter Montague, who's been involved in shutting down our campaign, said to me in person in February 2012, in another 10 years, Kevin, nobody's going to remember anything about you or the graves of those children. You can count on that. Well, the venerable muckraking journalist in Washington, D.C., I.F. Stone, once remarked that he didn't mind high-level cover-ups as much as the banal predictability of the whole thing. Well, he might have had Christian Canada in mind when he made that remark. I find one of the blessings and curses of having to live to nearly three score and ten years is that nothing surprises me anymore, especially when it comes to our homegrown atrocities. The speed and the efficiency by which Generations of slaughtered indigenous children are shoved into the ground or into furnaces by church and state, and then erased from official memory. The whole thing has been truly breathtaking, as has the burying of every effort to expose and prosecute that Canadian Holocaust. The killers in church and state have the Canadian public to thank for that, since it takes an entire village to not only raise a child, but to murder one, and to murder many. With that in mind, allow me an eye of stone moment as I sigh and shake my sadder but wiser head about the latest trite obfuscation of our group crime pissing down on all of us from the summits of the Great White North. Because now it's become fashionable to claim that there are no mass graves of Indian residential school children, even when the people making that claim also admit that many such children died. So then, where did all those little bodies end up if not under the ground? The Holocaust deniers are not saying. It's not an especially original claim. As early as 1903, barely a decade after the first death camps they call Indian schools opened, the Canadian government began suppressing records of the enormous death rates in the church-run camps while claiming that very few children were dying in there. We know that by the second year of these schools, over half of these kids were dying regularly. Meanwhile, while they were covering all that up, Ottawa was instructing their Indian agents to give the Catholic, Anglican, and United Churches a completely free hand to do whatever they wanted to the kids in those camps, quote, taking care to avoid too close an inquiry, unquote. In more re recent years, when our grassroots campaign of death camp survivors began protesting the crime and we launched our own investigative tribunal in June 1998, guilty church Officials quickly deny that any children had died in those death camps. One particularly silly United Church clergyman named Max Warren actually confronted me one day and screamed in my face and in front of smiling Vancouver reporters, quote, There was only one perpetrator in our residential schools, and I can guarantee he never killed a single child. Unquote. Well, comic relief aside, the latest naysayers are no more sophisticated in their lies than was poor Max Warren. In their mad scramble to close a book on any recollection of genocide in Canada, church, media, and academic pundits are clumsily contradicting themselves as they hurriedly revise previously accepted truths. For example, even their own stage-managed, perpetrator-run Truth and Reconciliation Commission officially stated that over half the children in the Indian schools were dying every year, and they were being buried in mass graves at nearly a hundred former such schools across Canada. But now Big Brother has rewritten his own history and shoved those remarks down the great Canadian memory hole. Nevertheless, it's been said by, at least by William Shakespeare, that murder will always come out. 
But of course, the bard lived long before the internet. Now that memory, knowledge, and official history can be reimagined and altered in the blink of an eye, and the shift is accepted and believed by masses of people, including the so-called awake ones, in that situation, hard-won truths and simple logic have nowhere to hang their hats anymore. Fortunately, something deeper abides. It's embodied in not only the witnesses to genocide, but those of us who have fought for years to unearth the crime, have held the bones of children in our hands, and have come to know the people who buried them. And of course, all of that evidence is found in MurderByDecree.com. But the question remains, where did the bodies of at least 65,000 children die? Who died? Where did those bodies go? Our campaign and its voluminous research have reputedly and repeatedly shown where they went. Into the ground, at first at least, and then into residential school furnaces when the staff ran out of burial sites. But according to the Canadian press, since at least 1960, the Canadian government has systematically destroyed evidence of criminality in those places and disinterred and wiped out mass graves of native children all over the country. The official church, state, and RCMP-led cleanup operation intensified when the schools officially closed in 1972, but especially after our protests and church occupations kicked in after our tribunal in 1998. And anyone with a shred of memory or brain matter knows all that. So it seems strange that the perpetrators of Canada's worst and most hidden crime feel the need to go to such ridiculous extents to wipe out all knowledge of their mass murder of children when the brutal truth has been so well concealed by them. The death camp survivors have been bought off, scared off, or killed off, our campaigns been destroyed, and the graves and their incriminating bones mostly dug up, dug up and pulped. So why would the powers who got away with the crime reopen the case and start talking about dead children again? Is there a latent guilt going on in them, exhibited even in the lifeless echelons of power, or something more at work? Well, one of the things you learn quickly on Canada's West Coast is that a mass grave is no respecter of persons, either past or present. The same body dumping grounds that for years held the remains of the Red School children or their smallpox exterminated elders are now routinely being used by today's death squads run by China, the RCMP, and their underworld government and church associates. Naturally, these guys don't want anyone poking around looking for mass graves because of what they might turn up bones that might have been put in there recently. One of the indicators of this is that one of the biggest deniers of residential school mass graves is the chief perpetrator of the crime, the Roman Catholic Church. Recently, top Catholic bishops have, quote, debunked the idea of such, such graves without, of course, providing any evidence to back up their remarks. But it's hardly a coincidence that the same church as Vatican Bank is a chief financial underwriter of the Chinese economic takeover of Canada's West Coast that's causing the deaths of so many Native people today. The Vatican Bank is bankrolling the extermination of Native tribes, occupying the natural gas and oil deposits hungered after by PetroChina and other companies. Early in 2012, after excavation at the Brentford death camp had unearthed children's bones and was shut down by government-paid Aboriginal chiefs, that shadowy RCMP spook named Peter Montague dropped by to gloat. After tossing me a grudging compliment that I was still at it after 15 years, despite all his efforts, this black ops specialist gave me an insider's grin and said to me, Kevin, in another 10 years, nobody's going to remember anything about you or the graves of those children. You can count on that. Well, that was 11 years ago, and, of course, Peter Montague was right. Very few people now remember it. But as I said to Peter Montague, it doesn't matter. For what's past is prologue, what's to come is in our hands. The cop just stared at me with a worried look. He obviously hadn't read Shakespeare. Stand by for more soon. Murderbydecree.com. This is Kevin Annett, Eagle Strong Voice.